Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Since withdrawing from the Non-Proliferation Treaty in 2003, North Korea successfully conducted three nuclear tests and officially declared in 2009 that it had developed a nuclear weapon. Beyond Pyongyang's rhetorics and the rumors around its atomic program, the DPRK's true nuclear capabilities remain largely unknown. Does North Korea have the technology and the weapon systems to deliver a nuclear warhead on targets in South Korea or even further in America? What would be the actual destructive power of these payloads? What is the current American and South Korean doctrine regarding nuclear deterrence? And perhaps more importantly, is effective deterrence towards North Korea and its nuclear weapons even feasible? To answer these questions, there is probably no one more qualified than our guest for this episode. Dr. Bruce Bennett, a senior defense analyst at the RAND Corporation and a professor at the Pardee RAND Graduate School. He specializes in asymmetric threats, such as weapons of mass destruction and Northeast Asian military issues. These include the future military force requirements in South Korea, the Korean military balance, counters to North Korean chemical and biological weapon threats in Korea and Japan, dealing with a North Korean collapse, changes in the Northeast Asia security environment, and deterrence of nuclear threats. Dr. Bennett has worked with the Office of the Secretary of Defense, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, U.S. forces in Korea and Japan, the U.S. Pacific Command and Central Command, the ROK and Japanese militaries, and the ROK National Assembly. He received his Bachelor of Science in Economics from the California Institute of Technology and his PhD in Policy Analysis from the Pardee Rand Graduate School. Dr. Bennett, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you. Um, first of all, what got you interested in the military issues of East Asia and in the Korean Peninsula more, more specifically? What's so unique and maybe so appealing about them? Well, during the 1980s, I was uh, building a computer model on uh, theater military operations, doing that for the director of net assessment in the Pentagon. And all of our work had been focused on the NATO Central Front. Uh, but in roughly 1989, he was asked by the Secretary of Defense to do a Korea balance study. And so he came to me and said he wanted to apply the model to Korea, which then sent me off to our intelligence community to try and figure out how Korea was going to be different, because it was pretty clear it was quite different from the European case. Um, before going any further, um, we'll be talking about deterrence in this interview. Can you maybe mm -hmm. explain what deterrence is and what, what do we mean when we talk about deterrence? With a country like North Korea, we each build military power on both sides. They do it and we do it in part to be able to fight if we have to, but I think on both sides our preference is generally that we would prefer not to fight. And so what we try to do is to posture ourselves to convince the potential opponent not to fight. Now that doesn't always work quite that way because North Korea has now declared that 2015 is the year for the war of unification. Uh, so uh, now deterrence becomes even more important from our side to convince North Korea that they don't want to take that kind of adventuristic possibility. Could you maybe give our listeners an example, a historical example of deterrence? Sure. Uh, during the Cold War, when we thought of uh, the competition with the Soviet Union, I mean, the United States built, what, 25 or 30,000 nuclear weapons. The Soviets built uh, 40,000 nuclear weapons. Nobody wanted to get involved in a nuclear war like that. But we had to posture ourselves so that the opponent could not do a first strike and destroy our weapons and then, in theory, win a war. Hmm. And so there was the posturing required to be able to survive, retaliate in a way that the opponent would not want. And in that way, we were able to deter. There are two words that we hear quite often when we talk about deterrence, second strike capability and mutually assured destruction. Can you maybe explain those two terms for our listeners? Sure, and, and uh, changes in those as well. Mm -hmm. Let me start with mutual assured destruction. In the 1950s, uh, the early part of the 50s, the United States still basically had a nuclear monopoly. The Soviets were trying to build their nuclear force, but we had a significant advantage. And as we developed, the problem in the, say, 1950 time frame was we didn't have very good intelligence on Russia. We didn't know where their military bases were, and so 
we basically planned to target cities. We kind of figured we could find the cities. We weren't sure what else we could find. Then in the mid-50s, we decided to move to a more extreme approach that was called assured retaliation. And in that case, we were going to go after everything, cities, military bases, the ones that we could find, and so forth. If the Soviets really tried to start a war, they invaded Western Europe or whatever, they were going to be devastated. We kept building in that way, and the problem was the Soviets were building nuclear weapons. Mm. And we got to the point where trying to build a defense against what the Soviets had built was extremely expensive. Not only was it expensive on the, on the top of things, but they could field one new warhead for a price that was maybe you know 20%, maybe 10% of what it would cost us to field the defense against that. And so when Secretary of Defense McNamara came in in the early 1960s, he said, we can't continue this, let's outbuild our opponent kind of notion. And so he shifted to a concept of assured destruction. Assured destruction was we wanted the ability, no matter what the Soviets did first, to be able to destroy three quarters of their industry and a quarter of their population. We figured if we could do that, there was no way they would be willing to start a war. Now, we weren't just going to do that as a first strike because the threat was they would try to hit us first and then we would have to retaliate. So second strike is they hit us first, we respond, and then we decide, we try to do that assured destruction in that response. Hmm. In those days, it was perceived that it would take 200 equivalent megatons, roughly, to achieve that level of damage. So with our average weapons today, that's somewhere in the neighborhood of six to 800 of our fairly larger size weapons mm -hmm. that potentially would be required to be fired at those cities. That's a lot of damage, it's a lot of impact. But by posing that against a risk averse adversary like the Soviet Union, they weren't gonna take the chance. They didn't wanna take the chance that, that that could be the outcome. The important thing about those terms now, though, is the assured destruction is no longer part of American policy. Back two years ago, the Defense Department released a nuclear employment strategy that was required by Congress. It was done openly, and it says the United States will not purposely target cities or people in the future. Mm. It said that countervalue, which was another term for assured destruction, was no longer part of American policy. But it didn't clearly say what well, was American policy. And that causes one of the quandaries then today. Let's maybe move on to a, an important question for us here in South mm -hmm. Korea. Is North Korea really a threat? And part of that, the first question I would like to ask you is that we all know that North Korea was interested in building a nuclear program since the end of the Cold War. Yet in the 90s, North Korea suffered from famines, saw its economy crumble down. So considering this context, why does North Korea continue to pour money and effort into acquiring nuclear weapons? Several purposes, obviously. And the one that seems most obvious, they have painted the United States as their perennial enemy. Now, they do that largely for internal purposes. I mean, the regime is a failing regime. It's not doing very well. And so they want to have somebody to blame so that they don't take responsibility. Um, so they say the United States causes all the problems, uh, you know, we're the great enemy. Even young school children are trained in how terrible the Americans were and how it would be a great opportunity for them to kill Americans and that sort of thing. So this is a part of the regime's strategy. Uh, if you're familiar with academic literature, there is a thing called diversionary war. And this is a diversionary cold war. They're diverting the attention of the people from the internal enemy to the <laughs> external enemy, which is the United States. That's what they're trying to do. So that's the beginning. Having said that, they then want to be able to make sure that the United States does not try to invade North Korea or take action against North Korea. 
After all, the North has violated agreements. It's under UN Security Council resolution. It violated those Security Council resolutions over a hundred times last year. So there is some chance that the outside world could indeed take military action against the North. And the North wants to make that very painful by Mm -hmm. having nuclear weapons available to respond. But there's one other part of all of that. Back in 1993, we had the first nuclear crisis in Korea. It became pretty clear that North Korea was doing some things toward building nuclear weapons. The United States started making a lot of noise about, well, what would we do? Well, according to a story in the 2008 foreign policy that fall, there's an article in foreign policy that's called something like The Secret History of Kim Jong-il. And it goes to 1993 and says, in 93, Kim Il-sung, the grandfather of the current leader, came and pulled together all his military leadership. And he asked the military leaders, if we have to go to war against the Americans, will we win? And of course, the military guys are all, yeah, we'll win, we'll win. (laughs) But then he asked, if we lose, what do we do? The military guys were all smart enough to know that was a really good time to keep your mouth shut. But his son, Kim Jong-il, the father of the current leader, spoke up reportedly and said, if we lose, I will destroy the earth. What good is the earth without North Korea? (laughs) That is referred to in some parts of the community as a Gotterdammerung kind of philosophy. Mm -hmm. He can't destroy the earth with tanks and guns. He really can't even destroy it with nuclear weapons and biological weapons, but he could do a whole lot of damage. And so that's a part of the North Korean philosophy, and they threaten that. The concern, of course, that the world has relative to that is, he didn't say, I will destroy South Korea and Japan and the United States. He did not exclude China. And whenever you hear Chinese senior personnel talking about, you know, if we have to go into North Korea to deal with refugees, what other things are we going to do? They almost always say, we're going to go in and police up the WMD, the weapons of mass Hmm. destruction, to include the biological and nuclear in particular, and for good reason. So a few days ago, um, various media reports quoted American and Chinese analysts saying that North Korea might have about some 20 nuclear bombs, Mm -hmm. and that this number might increase rapidly within the next few years. Does this make North Korea any more dangerous than, let's say, a few years ago? North Korea also does this kind of thing because they need support internally. You know, North Mm -hmm. Korea is in many cases a disaster of a country. To call it a third world country would be generous. And so they need something to prove that the regime is empowered. And they can't do it with their economy. They can't really do it with their politics. Nuclear weapons is one clear area where they can demonstrate that they're empowered. That's part of the leadership culture in the North. So they put it in their constitution. They're claiming they're a nuclear power and so forth. But if you've only got one or two nuclear weapons, It's kind of hard to argue you're a nuclear power. Mm -hmm. Um, So they've been building weapons to demonstrate that they really are, and they're really anxious to go back to the six party talks, not to renounce nuclear weapons, but to get the other countries to say, yeah, you're a nuclear power, which helps explain why the US administration is totally unwilling to go to the six party talks, because that's an unacceptable outcome to us. So they're building the weapons for that purpose. They're building the weapons so that it does not appear that they are vulnerable. So South Korea has been building what South Korea calls a kill chain. That is a counterforce capability, a capability to destroy the opponent's missiles and weapons. North Korea wants to have enough so that they can't all be destroyed by such an attack. And so that's a major push of North Korea to have plenty. But the other piece is, if you've got lots of nuclear weapons, 
you could fight a war with them, and they realize they're not going to win a conventional war. Hmm. They've got to have enough to do something that's hugely different. And number two, there is a general sense in the community of a theory called the stability-instability paradox, which North Korea would like to be do, able to do more provocations. Hmm. But that's hard to do if you don't have some threat that's above the provocations that nobody wants to go to. If they have the nuclear threat there, then they could do a provocation, and who's going to escalate out of fear that it could go into nuclear war? The latest North Korean nuclear test in 2013 is estimated to have used a bomb with the explosive power of approximately 5 to 15 kiloton of TNT, depending on the sources. That's actually less than either of the nuclear bombs dropped on, uh, on Japan in World War II, and less, if I'm correct, than a thousandth of the most powerful nuclear weapon the United States ever tested. So mm. I think the follow-up question is, how dangerous are those weapons really? Yeah. Well, the 2006 test, the very first one, it was yeah, somewhere less than a kiloton or around a kiloton. You know, a kiloton weapon going off in Seoul will only kill and seriously injure about 100,000 people. So, yeah, it's a small weapon, but excuse me, mm. um, a lot of people call that a fizzle. Uh, I, I don't look at it that way. You know, a 10 kiloton weapon, which is the range of the third test, now you're up to 350,000, maybe 400,000 for a weapon going off in Seoul. In the recent estimates by uh, David Albright and Joel Witt, they talk about 20 to 100 weapons in 2020, and in that higher range, if that's really the track they're on, having a number of weapons which would be up around 100 kilotons, that is even a much greater kind of impact. I mean, we would be talking about probably casualties in Seoul in the million range. So North Korea is moving to become a greater and greater threat, greater deterrence power, therefore, but also if they have to fight a war, a greater ability to fight that war. And I think increasingly people are worried in the outside. When North Korea had only one or two nuclear weapons, the general thought was, well, when we're advancing up to the gates of Pyongyang, mm -hmm. they'll use it for coercive purposes. But now increasingly people are thinking, you know, maybe they're going to try to use these weapons from early on in a conflict. They've got enough, they can hold some in reserve. It's entirely possible they could do that. And the kill chain that South Korea is building increases that probability. We have a concept which we call use it or lose it. If the North is being attacked in its nuclear and missile forces and they're losing them, at some point they will conclude they've got to use them or they're going to all be destroyed. And so literally the kill chain could push North Korea to use weapons at least well before they had otherwise thought about it. You mentioned the, the casualties if Seoul would be hit. Are you implying that then the prime target of North Korean nuclear weapons would always be civilians and South Korean civilians specifically? Because this would probably shift uh, a nuclear strike from you know, a, a military strike to terrorism. If you look at the traditional Scud or Nodong missile, the accuracy of those missiles is that, roughly speaking, half of the missiles will wind up within a couple of kilometers of the target. If it's a military target, that accuracy is inadequate. With, with a small nuclear weapon, a 10 kiloton weapon, you're not going to do the damage to the military target you want to. But if you've got a city, you know, so I miss my intended target by a kilometer or two, still going to wind up inside the city. So a part of this is the lack of accuracy of North Korean weapons. They have been working on terminally guided uh, missiles. The SS-21, which is now the KN-02 in North Korea, uh, appears to be one that is terminally guided, and there's some evidence that as early as 2005, North Korea was experimenting with terminal guidance. That would change the prospects so that they could meaningfully target nuclear targets. And then you have to worry about places like Camp Humphreys, where the American mm -hmm. military force is moving. And uh, could they decide to focus on that kind of target and not kill a lot of Koreans? So could the North Koreans then deliver those nukes properly? Do they have the technology so far to do so? And how far actually could they hit? 
Yeah, we really don't know. Mm. Until North Korea tests a nuclear weapon on a ballistic missile, we can't be certain that they can put one on a ballistic missile. The first generation design that they probably tested with at least the first two tests would be way too big to put on a ballistic missile. They claim that their third test was miniaturized and that it would go on a ballistic missile. They, according to a number of reports, got the Chinese design for the Chinese fourth nuclear test, which was one that went on a ballistic missile. And so, in theory, they could be building those. Hmm. There are a lot of tricky technologies to make sure they work and you would want to test it. But we just don't know if they can deliver by a ballistic missile. Nevertheless, you've seen recently American commanders saying, you know, we don't know for sure, but we need to be able to defend against this threat. This is the kind of thing which, if we don't defend against it, we're irresponsible. Meanwhile, the Korean Defense Ministry has been saying, well, we don't know for sure either, but we don't want to alarm people and, and, and you know, just cause panic. Mm. And so we're not going to say it until we're much more sure. This is, a, this is an issue of different concerns of the different groups as opposed to a difference in perception. We don't know for sure. Mm. We're hoping to find out at some point, but not because they test one. Considering all of this, would North Korea be able to achieve deterrence, true deterrence against its enemies via its nuclear program? Because if I understand correctly, it seems unlikely they would be able to destroy a country and they do not have any second strike cap uh, capability. They have deterred South Korea and the United States for mm. what, 60 some years. So deterrence has existed and it existed well before they built nuclear weapons. The South Korea and the United States are not a country like North Korea, where the offensive into North Korea is our prime objective. But if you turn it around, if North Korea decides to invade South Korea, is South Korea just going to say, oh, no big deal, you just killed several hundred thousand people, we're just going to blow it off and let you stay in the leadership position and, oh, maybe do it again in two or three years. No, if North Korea crosses that threshold, mm -hmm. Uh, the South is, and the United States will lark, likely be compelled to go up and remove the regime so it doesn't happen again. But that's not our focus. Our focus is defensive. Meanwhile, North Korea declaring that 2015 is the year for the war of unification. Well, there's no way you can, North Korea can unify favorably hmm. unless it's with the military forces. There's certainly, I mean, you know, if you get a peaceful unification of North and South Korea, who's going to dominate with an economy which is way bigger, what, 40, 50 times bigger in terms of GDP than the North? Pretty clear who's going to dominate in that kind of case. So North's only option is a military option. But putting, putting uh, North Korean rhetorics uh, aside, is there anything that could undermine the assumption that North Korea has a program that is purely defensive in nature? I think if they are going to fight a war, they have to recognize that South Korea and the United States are technologically superior. And that level of superiority is substantial. There is no way without the use of weapons of mass destruction that they have any chance of winning that kind of conflict. Hmm. And the American commanders in Korea have been quite specific about that, saying they just can't win, but they may be hopeful that they could win if they use nuclear weapons, biological weapons early on, with all the risk those things entail. That's a path which they may well choose to take. Is there any other likely scenario under which uh, North Korea could use its nuclear capability? Is, for example, a first strike imaginable, as is often portrayed in the media? You have to, you have to ask, what would be the objectives of mm. that first strike? Think about Kim Jong-un. I don't think he's going to wake up someday and say, you know, this is a darn good day to go to war. Let's just, you know, get everybody going to, today, send them south. I know we're going to win. That's not going to happen. But he could wake up someday and say, you know, I am really worried that the military is about to rebel against me. And I am so concerned about this, I need to keep them busy. And the way to keep them busy is to tell them to go south. Now, I'm pretty sure that if they go south, I'm not going to win. But if I can just get to a new 
armistice, keeping them busy and having them do things and accomplishing things, then maybe I survive this. Mm -hmm. And that's diversionary war theory, that he could do that kind of thing. If he's going to do that, he has to recognize that the South Korean defenses in front of Seoul could be a brick wall. And if they run into that brick wall, then they really do lose. Mm -hmm. And so I think at that stage, he's got to say, what can I do to break that brick wall? And nuclear weapons would be one way to break that wall. So this would not be limited to nuclear weapons against the Blue House or National Assembly or whatever. This could be directly targeted at troop locations to blow a hole in the defenses that they could then exploit. So now from the perspective of South Korea, what are the potential options for the South Korean state and its army to react should there be a nuclear attack? Well, the first thing you want to do is you want to try to deter nuclear weapon use. So let's go back to the concept. Kim Jong-un wakes up. He says, I'm worried about the army uh, rebelling against me. I'm going to order him to go south. If you want to deter a leader who's taking that kind of position, you tell him, you use a nuclear weapon and our first retaliation will be against you. You will not survive this war. Mm. And we'll do it with conventional means, we'll do it with nuclear means. You aren't going to survive. So, you know, think about diversion. It isn't going to work. And I think that becomes the key is defining the nature of the retaliation we would make has a much better chance of deterring him first. Secondly, if we still don't deter him, we need to be prepared to execute that. Now, every time he does a nuclear test, he disappears. Mm. And I don't know if you've watched that, but he goes into hiding. And his father before him has done that. And when they've done long-range missile tests, they've often done the same thing. So we would need to have very good intelligence systems to identify where he is so that we could target him. Mm. But I think one of the most powerful things we could do to deter him would be to say, you know, you did a nuclear test on this date. Two o'clock in the afternoon, we know where you were. It was here. Because then he would know, even with his trying to disappear, we could have targeted him. Hmm. That's kind of stage one. Stage two is, okay, what happens if he still goes to war, takes the chance? We've then got to be prepared to respond with, with weapons. And that's where the South Korean government has decided to build this kill chain. You know, the concept is, if he uses nuclear weapons, we need to be able to take them out. The thing that's unique about North Korean missile capabilities is, on average, they've got something like 10 missiles per launcher. So they can't just send all the missiles out on launchers and launch them all. They've instead got to launch one set, then bring the launchers back and reload, and then launch a second set. So you do not have to be preemptive against that kind of capability. You just have to be good enough that when they bring the launchers out and start using them, that you can destroy them. And hopefully you know where the spare missiles are stored so you can destroy those locations as well. If you can do that, then you need to be able to defend against that first or second round of missiles before you've destroyed the launchers and the missile storage. That's where you need missile defense. So the Patriot defenses we've been talking about, mm. the THAAD that's being discussed within the community. We'll talk about them later as well. Yeah, those are all important to dealing with that first wave and the second wave, but it doesn't have to be big enough to cover every nuclear weapon if you've got a good counterforce capability. From a bird's eye's view, uh, um, what role does the United States play in South Korea's defense strategy? And does South Korea rely on American nukes to ensure deterrence against North Korea as a last resort, or is that already embedded in the chain, maybe the kill chain you meant? Sure. People in Korea tend to look at the American presence in Korea, the 28,500 or whatever the number currently is, as the U.S. commitment. And that's just not right. You know, the, if a war occurs, the United States will send hundreds of thousands of military personnel to Korea. So think about this from a Korean perspective. 
if the Koreans had to build this defense on their own, they'd have to double or triple their defense budget. Instead, they're getting an American defense commitment, which they don't have to pay for, which they don't have to have people on their soil in military bases, training, and so forth. They just come when they're needed. What better deal could the Korean people get than that? So that is a part of the American commitment. We're going to deploy people. We have got state-of-the-art technology that North Korea isn't even close on. If the North really wants to start a war, they're going to take a lot of damage. Having said that, the end state that the South Koreans generally want is unification at the end of such a war. So we don't want to cause a whole lot of damage to North Korean industry, to the people, and so forth. And that's where the precision that the American weapons bring is important, to be able to attack military targets while causing minimal damage to the civilian population and the industry. So that's the going in issue. Now, on the nuclear side, the U.S. has created what it refers to as a nuclear umbrella. It's a form of extended deterrence. The Koreans are not directly deterring North Korea's nuclear weapon use. Instead, the U.S. is extending that deterrence by saying, North Korea, if you use nuclear weapons, you have to face an American nuclear retaliation. That choice, though, is an American president's. Hmm. The American president is the only person in the United States authorized to make that decision of, do we use nuclear weapons? If we do, what do we use them against? How many do we use? And the American president doesn't write out a memo saying, oh, by the way, if Kim Jong-il fires a nuclear weapon at Pusan, do this. But if he fires one at Seoul, do that. Hmm. He's going to make a decision when he sees the situation and decide to respond appropriately. Now, there's, as I said, strategy behind the American commitment ways that we would respond that are generally specified. But in the end, the president will make that decision. You mentioned the, the THAAD systems, Terminal mm -hmm. High Altitude Area Defense, and their deploy possible deployment in South Korea. There have been a lot of conversation uh, in the mm -hmm. United States and here. What is this technology exactly, and why does America want to station these missile systems in South Korea? The THAAD system is a capability to reach adversary missiles and warheads well above the altitude that Patriot can reach. And it also reaches warheads and missiles coming in much faster than Patriot's going to do well with. Uh, the Scud missile systems that North Korea has, they've got a range of three to 500 kilometers. They come in fairly fast, but the Nodong missiles, which most people th assume will be the nuclear carrier, they come in much faster, and we want to reach them at a higher altitude. That gives us a better chance of destroying them and destroying them in a way where minimal damage is done to the ground. THAAD is intended to add a layer of defense. We want to defend up higher in a better way, more capable. If somehow that misses, then you want Patriot underlying it to pick up mm -hmm. at that stage. So that's the layering kind of system. The THAAD in particular, we would want to focus it on whatever missiles North Korea is using, which are likely nuclear. And again, that's probably the Nodongs, uh, at least as a first cut for, for the next five or 10 years. But how effective would be the THAAD technology? How realistic is it? We've been talking for decades about all these anti-missile technologies. I think Israel is quite an impressive example of their use in, in recent years, but how could South Korea reliably defend population centers with that technology? Is, is it proven? Certainly it's been tested fairly mm -hmm. extensively. Has it been used against an adversary? Well, not directly, but if you go back to 2003, we were operating in, out of Kuwait. The Iraqis were firing not Scud missiles, but relatively short-range missiles. And we intercepted many of them with the Patriot system that was performing against missiles it wasn't really designed that well to deal with because they were coming in lower mm -hmm. and so forth. And they did pretty well in defending against them. There are many aspects of the technology which are similar, but 
with the thad, it's got to be able to react more quickly. It's got to hit something faster. I think the chances are good that it would operate well. Said differently, thad has been tested a whole lot more than the no-dunks have been tested. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we've got a relatively good chance uh, of being able to do that. There's still trade-offs, though, I mean, in terms of, of the Korean people. Hmm. There are other systems. There's the naval SM-6 system, which defends in much the same kind of range that South Korea could be buying to put on their Aegis uh, destroyers, which have no anti-missile capability, which is a little strange, but hmm. it's expensive. So, But it seems though the crux of the discussion right now in South Korea is that South Korea does not want to pay for the THAAD systems. So what does that tell us, and shouldn't maybe South Korean politicians want to acquire the technology by any means necessary? Yeah. The step back to where mm. the U.S. is in the THAAD performance. As of the end of 2014, we had four THAAD batteries. Uh, in 2015, we'll get a fifth. In 2016, we'll get a sixth. Back a year ago, we put one of those batteries in Guam. Generally speaking, in a peacetime situation, the U.S. usually figures that we can have one out of three of any kind of force forward deployed. So one out of three when you've got four systems means one. Hmm. And when you've got five, it still means one. And when you've got six, then you can go to two. But we won't have six until the end of 2016, roughly speaking. So THAAD is really an issue for Korea unless we decide to pull out of the defense out of Guam, which I don't think we will, for Korea in 2017. That's why when the issue has been raised by China in particular, most American defense officials are saying, wait a minute, we're not ready to make this decision. You know, in 2016, it could be that there's some new place in the world where the war is a threat that we've got to put THAAD there rather than in Korea. Hmm. So they're saying, hold off. People are not understanding that the U.S. is just trying to kick the can down the road. It's that we don't really have the capacity at the current point in time. Will it come to Korea at some point? Probably. Uh, it probably will. At this stage, there's no greater missile threat to U.S. and allied interests than in Korea. Uh, but that is yet to be determined. You touched upon uh, U.S. Uh, nuclear doctrine. According mm -hmm. to the report on nuclear employment strategy, the U.S. will not intentionally target civilian populations or civilian objects. Mm -hmm. The question, I think, is why is that? Isn't the whole point of mutually assured destruction to, well, <laughs> destroy your opponent? Going back to the Cold War, what the U.S. strategy was in the Cold War was we can't be sure we're going to destroy enough of other things, but we can sure get the cities. There's very little they can do to prevent that. You know, I'm sorry, but morally, I find that repugnant. Mm. I find that just unacceptable. And I think that's what the current administration in the U.S. views it as, is it's morally repugnant. The question is, can you do enough damage to the other side its military capabilities, and in particular its leadership, such that they would also be deterred. And I think the U.S. views today that, yes, we can do that much damage. Do you think the U.S. will maintain this, this moral stance you mentioned for long? After all, I mean, the North Korean population is highly militarized. If we would fall into a full-scale conflict, sacrifices will have to be made. I, we will, but I think you turn to how South Korea is going to view it as well. Hmm. South Korea wants the end state to be unification. Do they really want 10 million dead North Koreans um, who are their brothers and going to be part of their country? I mean, according to the South Korean constitution, as I understand it, they're citizens of Korea. Do they really want that? I don't think so. Those people didn't have anything to do with the North Korean decision to go to war and to treat and to carry out the war as intended. So I think an American president's going to look at that and say, these are innocent people. I'm not going to kill them. I'm going to go after the people who are responsible. Talking to politicians, analysts, and, well, academics about the North Korean nuclear program, one can sometimes get the impression that the international community has run out of ideas on how to deal with this with this issue. And would you would you agree with this assessment? And would you say that the current US strategic patience is a synonym for we have no ideas anymore? 
Well, I think it's not so much a case of no ideas as it is a case of what's politically feasible. You know, from the position of the American uh, government, every time they've tried to negotiate with North Korea, North Korea has reneged, it's cheated. You know, you can't keep negotiating with somebody who won't keep their commitments and have that be politically viable in a democracy. And so I think the administration has looked at this case and said, we don't really have much to gain from negotiating with the North. We can potentially be seriously embarrassed if we negotiate with the North. And so we're waiting for the North to demonstrate that they're prepared to actually be serious. And I think that that's just the nature of, of a democracy. You, you can't negotiate with, I mean, think back to World War II. Neville Chamberlain comes back from negotiating with Adolf Hitler and says, oh, we got peace for our time by giving up part of Czechoslovakia to, to Hitler. And what had he done? Well, Hitler wasn't negotiating because he wanted to come to a more peaceful world. He was trying to use negotiations as an element of warfare. That's where North Korea is. They are using this as an element of warfare. Now, it's warfare in peacetime. It's not actually killing people. But they're trying to accomplish things to put off action against their nuclear program, to allow them to do things. And it's very difficult for us as a result to try to rein them in. What role is China playing in this context? Uh, I think China is commonly referred to as the only supporter of, of North Korea, willingly or unwillingly. Would China's assertiveness on this nuclear issue uh, bring some progress? I think China has tried to balance between not doing so much that they lose any ability to influence North Korea, but doing enough to at least slow North Korea down. Um, I look at the period over the last two years since the third North Korean nuclear test. Right after that test, the South Korean defense minister testified to the National Assembly that North Korea had two weapons ready to test that were already underground. All they had to do was to push the button for them to go. And they haven't been tested yet. I don't think it has been American actions which has prevented that. I don't think it's been South Korean. I think it's been Chinese actions which has prevented that fourth nuclear test. Now, there could be other factors as well, but I think China has actually been successful in that area. But on the other hand, we don't know how long that's going to last. Hmm. Uh, North Korea likes to make a point of China doesn't control us, we're you know self-reliant, we can do things. Sooner or later, they're going to do a test. But I think China has done what they think they can. And you've got to remember, the China-North Korea alliance is not a normal alliance. In a normal alliance, you plan with your ally, you exercise with your ally. Mm. China does none of that with North Korea. So this is not the typical concept of an alliance. Is the nuclear program even something uh, that North Korea is willing to negotiate on? Uh, we had two speakers here on the show that mentioned what happened to Gaddafi, who gave up his nuclear weapons. And isn't that a cautionary tale for the Kim family that you should definitely make sure that you still have them close to you? And isn't it time maybe to admit that the international community has failed, that North Korea is now a de facto nuclear state, and that this is not going to change? North Korea has actually made a big deal about the Gaddafi case. I mean, they've said a whole lot about how Gaddafi was wrong, he made a big mistake, he shouldn't have done it. Um, so, yeah, I think there is a point that North Korea has made and perceived of this that, and I think it's highly unlikely that North Korea will give up its nuclear weapons. Again, internal politics. What do they have to cite that indicates that the regime is truly empowered and capable? Uh, not much more than the nuclear weapons. So it's going to be very hard to get them to that kind of place. So it's the end of the six-party talks, in effect. Well, no, North mm. Korea wants the six-party talks so that the other five parties come and declare North Korea a nuclear power. That's what they <laughs> want to negotiate about. They've been very clear they don't want to negotiate about getting rid of their nuclear weapons. Now, having said that, I think we need to do a, a reevaluation, and it's hard to do that in the current administration. But a new administration might be able to come along in the United States and say, okay, the notion of getting rid of North Korea's nuclear weapons, it isn't going to happen. Hmm. But maybe 
we can get them to slow their program, something like that. And there would be value to that. Is that unacceptable to the current administration? Absolutely. They've been very clear they want to denuclearize. But is it better than letting North Korea go cranking off, building lots of nuclear weapons? Yeah, probably. Do we want to give a lot to North Korea for that? Do we want to recognize them as a nuclear power? Well, we have to be very careful with the term nuclear power. According to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, there are only five nuclear powers, and that's going to be true in perpetuity. North Korea wants to be declared a nuclear power because it makes them look like they're a peer of the United States. They've been very clear about that. Um, we need to be very clear that this does not make them be a peer. And I've really called North Korea a nuclear experimenter, not a nuclear power. Hmm. There's no indication that they've got nuclear forces prepared to operate and so forth. And even once they do, they're non-compliant meaning they're not following the non-proliferation treaty. Even if they've withdrawn from it, they're still non-compliant. And I would argue they're probably dangerous. Mm -hmm. What kind of controls do they have on their nuclear weapons? If some rogue general decides to blow one sometime, I'd be very worried about that. Now, I'd be worried about it if I was Kim Jong-un as well. But them having 20 or 30 or 40 nuclear weapons, they're going to have them more dispersed. That's dangerous. Under what circumstances might other countries, South Korea of course, but maybe Japan, conclude that the best defense against North Korea would be to have nuclear weapons of their own? And would this change the whole political situation, the whole balance in the region? Well, there have been a number of, of people in South Korea who have taken that position, who have argued that maybe we need our own, usually given for two or three reasons. I mean, number one, the, the typical reason is Sooner or later, the U.S. is going to leave Korea. And when they leave Korea, what choice do we have? Mm -hmm. But another reason that they often cite is, if we had nuclear weapons to trade with the North, then maybe the North would take negotiations more seriously. And there is some possibility of that. I'm a little skeptical, but there is certainly a possibility. I think, though, the more dangerous thing would be, let's say North Korea does use a nuclear weapon in a demonstration only, not, not a full war. The U.S. has put so much emphasis on our nuclear weapons are for deterring the use of a nuclear weapon that South Korea and Japan might conclude in that case that our nuclear umbrella failed. Hmm. And even, you know, regardless of how we respond, that there was a failure there. And at that point, they may conclude. So North Korea is getting into dangerous space with their approaches recently, and they could trigger that. That is not from a U.S. perspective in our interest for either Japan or South Korea to go nuclear. The situation today, in a way, stems from what happened in June 1994. Mm -hmm. After years of negotiations, the U.S. was really on the brink of war with North Korea over its, its nuclear program. Looking back from today, would you say that a decisive military strike on those facilities at the time would have brought a conclusion that we would be thankful for now, or by now? And we're asking with an eye actually on, on Pentagon estimates that quoted in the media that said that a new Korean war would result in casualties in the region of over a million. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we had done a preemptive strike at that time, I think the general concern was that would be the beginning of a big war. It wasn't going to be limited to just a, a surgical strike. Even if we did a conventional weapon only, that the North would then invade the South or whatever, and yeah, you'd have probably at least a million people killed. That was something that we were not prepared to do, uh, to cause that kind of damage, but not prepared in part because we weren't sure that Yongbyon was the extent of the program. Um, now we're pretty sure that Yongbyon isn't, that there's lots of other things elsewhere. We don't know exactly where all of those things are. We just don't know where they are. If you don't know where things are, then it's hard to do a surgical strike. And I think that's a lesson North Korea has learned, where they try to deny us that information. Yeah, had we gotten rid of, the, of a significant part of the program, it might have slowed it. But it's the same thing we're facing with Iran today. You know, we could slow the Iranian program a year or two or three years or maybe a little bit more, but we can't stop it if they decide to go whole hog. And that's 
So negotiating to get some kind of agreement, and we were very hopeful that the agreed framework would stop things. I think there was a certain degree of naivete there in the sense that we were assuming that if we cut off their fissile material source, that we, it would stop it, not recognizing that they would have other sources, enriching uranium being the best example. Um, and as best I can tell, they were doing work on their nuclear program during that period. They just weren't creating more plutonium at the mm -hmm. Beyond plant. North Korea does a good job of getting around agreements, but in the end, it cuts the trust. And that is exactly what President Park tried to say in her article in Foreign Affairs back several years ago before she became president, that we've got to create the trust again. Until you get that trust, I don't think the U.S. is going to negotiate with North Korea. At this very moment, we are talking in the center of Seoul. Mm -hmm. If North Korea strikes South Korea right now, it will be most probably here since we're in the mm -hmm. center of the city. Should the people of South Korea be concerned or should I say afraid in an active way or should we maybe downplay the fact that North, North Korea is, is our neighbor? There is a general feeling in Korea that it is better not to have the people oversensitized on this subject. Having said that, the government needs to set a more positive example. Back in 2005, the South Korean government, their defense ministry, put together what's called a defense reform plan. They did that because for 30 years up until roughly that point, they'd had enough young men turn draft age that they could sustain an army of roughly 560,000. They, however, now have a demographics which is drawing down seriously, I mean, very seriously. By 2025, 2026, their army will probably be around 300,000, which isn't big enough probably to stabilize North Korea after a war or whatever. So they had planned to do a technology versus manpower trade-off. This was supposed to create the weapon systems and so forth to replace men. In that plan, the research and development and acquisition budget line for 2015 was about 20 trillion won. The number this year will be about 11 trillion won. Mm. So fundamentally, the South Korean government has not been serious about creating the defense. Uh, there's a lot of concern in South Korea that, you know, the U.S. isn't quite doing this rebalancing into Asia and so forth. The U.S. has been very clear. We are going to be limited budget-wise because we'd overextended our budget. Our allies need to pick up most more of their own security requirements. It's just a fact. Korea hasn't quite swallowed that fact mm. yet, and it's a piece which needs to be looked at more seriously. Living in South Korea, um, I have to say the North Korean threat is barely a feature of, of everyday mm. life. And sometimes it feels other countries perceive the threat that the North Korean nuclear program poses as much more severe than here. Uh, and this stands in line with the assertion we heard from Professor Andrei Lankov, who said that the further away people live from North Korea, the more afraid they are. Um, do you agree with that, with that statement? To a certain extent. I mean, certainly the Japanese are more concerned, I think, on an individual basis than most South Koreans. And the historical animosity there helps explain mm. part of that. Uh, for many years, there, there was a feeling, oh, back in the mid-60s, that, hey, North Korea is building chemical weapons, but they'd never use them against their Korean brothers because, you know, you don't do that brother to brother. I think the Korean people need to be a little more sensitive to the threat they face. I don't think they should be worried about it night and day. I mean, I go back to the Cold War. I mean, you had people who wouldn't sleep at night because, gee, we got to build the bomb shelter out in our backyard or something like that. That's extreme. But I think a greater commitment to building the defensive capabilities is important. Too much of that has been slipping, and it is undermining the deterrence of North Korea, I believe. To conclude, Dr. Bennett, and maybe on a personal note, mm -hmm. as an analyst writing about uh, the Korean Peninsula extensively, don't you get sometimes tired? 
because regardless of policy initiatives, of talks, reproachment, diplomatic clashes, nothing really seems to change. And I guess I would say they may not seem to change, but things do change. I mean, I can remember being in the defense ministry in 1996, and uh, I was giving a presentation on North Korean chemical weapons threat. And I was literally told by several people, our brothers will never do this to us. The South Koreans now no longer feel that way. They've come to an appreciation that the North could do this. After all, they did shell Yonpyeong Island. They did sink, you know, a warship and so forth. So things change, but they tend to be more incremental than the huge changes we'd love to have. That's why I think we need to be sensitive to the incremental things. Small changes in the defense budget, another 2 or 3% every year, well, those aggregate over time. And that's why the defense budget is so far behind is, well, we only cut it from 8% to 6% for one year. Well, except the next year you cut it a little bit more. So we've got to be very sensitive about those modest changes, making sure that we're building an adequate capability. The other kind of thing we've got to make sure of is that we're really working closely together uh, and understanding the capabilities. And I would argue we need to be trying to involve all of the regional countries. If North Korea really does go to war, um, China might have an important role on our side this mm. time. And that's the kind of thing we should talk about with China. I mean, Xi Jinping has said, I support a peaceful unification of Korea. I think it should happen. He said that several times. But then if North Korea starts a war and that leads to unification, I mean, that wasn't South Korea's fault. Yeah, we hope it doesn't happen. But if it does, do we really think the Chinese will say, no, 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 we're not going to support this because, you know, it was a war. Mm. I think China would probably be pretty practical about that. And I think they would also intervene because they don't want the refugees crossing the border that would otherwise cross the border. They don't want the WMD, the weapons of mass destruction, pointed at Chinese cities. They're going to try to deal with those things. We need to have greater discussion on that, and it may need to start at an academic level. I mean, the South Korean government isn't going to go to China and say, yeah, it's okay if you come 100 kilometers into North Korea. But at least academically, we need to start thinking about the theories and the capabilities and so forth that would be required to deal with the North Korean threat, which is now growing significantly and really needs to be relooked at. Dr. Bennett, thank you so much for being our guest today and for your insights. It was really interesting. Thank you. A great opportunity. Appreciate it. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.